and to expand our staff and grow. So that's what we're asking for. What would we use the money for? To, of course, increase the staff, the payroll, so that um, I can be free to sell and uh, go after some of these contracts more aggressively. Um, we want to increase the speed of market to our expanded services, and we want to accelerate the production of our media products. So that's our offer, and just remember that we are the, the Pied Pipers, and we're more than Americans. We are citizens of the world. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll let the, the sharks. Um, unfortunately, uh, maybe even for the, the future, um, the, the participants that are going to come after, um, get to the numbers as soon as possible, because that's going to dictate um, every other conversation that we're going to have. Uh, so, so I guess I'll pass the, the, uh, the microphone to CJ so he can ask his question. Yeah, the, the, the China aspect is, is very interesting because of, um, you know, Alibaba's in the press a lot now, and I think it's highlighting a lot of the, the progress that uh, uh, the China relationship, why China relationships matter to businesses of all sizes and kinds, regardless of whether uh, they're African American or not. So that, that's, that's a great niche. Um, the media business is, is, seems like it's, that's one of your high margin businesses because you, you create the content once and then uh, it gets distributed, syndicated globally, right? So, so that's pretty good. Uh, the federal PR stuff I know very little about. Consulting opportunities and the networking events, what are your margins like in, in, that, in those businesses? So, so, so all up, if you can give me an aggregated gross margin number, that would be interesting, or a range. Uh, we usually have a 20% uh, margin on our PR products, our consulting products. Can you tell me a bit about the consulting, your consulting part of your business, like who's your, who's your market, what kind of services do you provide? Um, we provide strategic uh, introductions, if you will. For example, we'll take presidents of universities from America, mainly African American in the last few years, and take them to China, introduce them to their counterparts, Chinese university presidents, so that they can do exchange programs. Uh, we helped Xavier University to become the first HBCU to have a Confucius Institute on their campus, and they've been soaring, not only with their students and faculty um, studying in China, but also attracting students from China to come here. And that's one of the things we're hoping to do is to help HBCUs increase their student enrollment by bringing students not only from China, but we're looking at Africa and other places as well. Have you also considered, I know you're focused on education exchange, you know, kind of educational exchange, but um, I think the most interesting out of all of these is the consulting opportunities, particularly the whole globalization, companies who want to go enter China, um, you know, uh, in South America, but they don't have, maybe they don't have contacts. Um, also, um, teaching people cultural competency, how to do business in a different culture. I mean, to me, that's really, um, that really resonates. Um, and so, but are you just focused on the educational? No, that's one, that's one of the components. We are, um, um, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to be freed up, too, to do more selling to corporations who want to enter the market. We've been approached just recently by a group of Chinese entrepreneurs who all went to school here, and they don't even know how to do business in their own country, uh, connecting with people here. So people are contacting us, and we're reaching out. It's just the time that I need to do more of that. Um, and in terms of cultural competency and cultural literacy, um, what we do as a part of our uh, briefings to delegations that we take over is we link up with the State Department to do cultural briefings, and we actually educate people if you're going to China, you know, this is how you give your card. Uh, you don't bow, but with two fingers, and you receive, and you don't just put it in your pocket or put it away, but you put the card on the table and look at it because it represents the person. Um, we do talk about... Um, you know, how translation is being used and how body language is very important and how you don't want to offend other people in certain countries. So we are very country specific because it just depends. If you're in Brazil, it may mean one thing, as you know. If you're in China or Africa, it may mean something else. Thank you. Um, so my question is about the team. You mentioned, I think you said there are three full-time uh, employees and you have, that's, that staff is augmented. So could you tell us a little bit more about who else is with you on the business? Um, well, I own the business 100%. Um, 
we uh, have two full-time employees. We have three regular employees, meaning they get paid every month, but they're not in the office with us on a daily basis. Um, and then I augmented with other professionals. We have teams of people kind of all over the world uh, that may be right for us. We have some writers in California who do some things from us, for us from all over. So and, we, and we hire interns as well. Okay, so I guess the reason why I'm asking is it seems like the secret sauce of the business is you. And so what happens if something, God forbid, happens to you, what happens to the business? That's why I'm replacing myself in a lot of ways. <laughs> Maybe I can't totally replace myself in terms of personality on some of the shows, but I can replace myself in terms of writing, uh, in terms of writing the, um, you know, uh, the pitches for corporations, in terms of putting together different teams. I am um, grooming some smaller PR companies, some younger people to also help take up some of the things that I'm doing so that I can be more free to sell. But I can be replaced for the most part. Maybe not 100%, but uh, quite a bit of me can be replaced. So I'll, I'll just uh, one, one comment. So it's just, in, uh, from my personal perspective, it just the timing happens to be really interesting, right? Because, so, so I'm happy to kind of have a further discussion with you and, and get on the deal table. Um, the reason is that um, I, I didn't know anything about the Chinese market about a year ago, but for the last year or so, um, it just so happened that I was talking to an entrepreneur about an app that they wanted to launch called Friendly Deals, and it ended up being, uh, you know, the diligence that I did for, for that app over that period of time, and it's targeted at, uh, you know, the eight, eight is a lucky number for the Chinese, yeah. and everything in that app is going to be $88 plus. It's targeted because the Chinese are apparently very brand conscious. Yes. The app is all red in color, and, and you know all that stuff. I learned, you know, this is stuff I didn't know, right? So, and what would be interesting is, at a bare minimum, um, what I'd like to be able to do is conduct further diligence by when you're in New York, uh, have you talk to the Chinatown community? There's a big Chinatown revival uh, initiative going on in, in, in Chinatown right now. Um, I'm not Chinese. I'm Indian. I don't speak any Chinese. <laughs> but but they're all uh, they're 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 extremely deep, um, and and uh, I think they'd be delighted to. So at a bare minimum, I think what could come out of it for you is potentially another client. Uh, but furthermore, they have co-invested with me on on uh, many many deals. So mm -hmm. I think um, you know there is some potential there. So excited thank to you. Talk to you, thank you. So um, I guess that's one shark that wants to have a follow-up <laughs> conversation, <Yay>. which is good. <laughs> that's good. Um, Thank you. So um, I know that we're short on time, so we're actually going to put an express version on this. Okay. So thank you very much for your time, and I guess we'll have the next uh, applicant come up. Thank you. So we're going to keep it moving, but the best thing about being first is that you are the catalyst. And with that in mind, you did a fantastic job, Ms. Wilson. Let's give her another quick round of applause. I'm inspired by your business and we'll be talking. So with that in mind, let's, let's uh, make a, a quick announcement for our presenters and hopefully you all can hear me if you're in the, um, in the foyer. What we're going to do, because we do have time constraints and um, one of our sharks has to get moving at around 425, so we don't have much time and we want to make sure that he's present for as many of the presentations as possible. So we're going to ask that as the uh, panel asks, if you can make your financial projections, um, it's, it's close to the beginning, give us a synopsis of what you do, but then give us other, the, your financials, and then let's hear from our sharks to see if perhaps they're interested or if they can give you some guidance towards your business. Um, let's try to do that within a two minute time frame. We have to do an elevator pitch. We gotta keep it moving because that's what business does, right? So we're gonna keep it moving and make sure that everybody can be heard and seen. So with that in mind, we have our next presenter with orgasmic ears, Latrice Herndon. Oh, I'm sorry, it's, it seems like it says that, but why don't you tell us? Thank you. You got the room ready for me at least. How is everyone doing? That's good. 
No worries, no orgasms, okay? Uh, the name of my company is actually Orgasmic Ears. And Orgasmic Ears. And uh, what our primary focus is, is a flip on the industry of audiology as it is. Most people here uh, probably don't know what an audiologist is. You're looking at one. Um, if you've ever had a hearing test before, you heard the beep, you raised your hand, that's what we do. Uh, what we're looking at doing is combating uh, minorities uh, who are in a, a kind of frail zone when it comes to hearing and hearing disorders. Uh, most school children don't get what they need uh, as far as preventative services are concerned, nor do adults. So what happens is when they um, pretty much end up in their mid to adult lives, uh, they find themselves with a hearing loss, and if no one here has ever seen the price of a hearing aid, four to 6000 for a pair, and, um, oh, it gets better. Your insurance doesn't cover it. Um, so that's out of pocket per uh, person. What we're actually seeking, we are actually a startup company. So we're actually seeking roughly around $300,000 so that we can look at targeting certain areas. Um, first and foremost is schools. We're looking to get into schools for education purposes, one, and also for uh, a whole line of swimmers modes for children. The reason why most children in schools who are delayed learners have unilateral hearing losses. Unilateral hearing losses result from otitis media. Otitis media results from fluid within the middle ear, which can come from swimming, um, lack of tubes, or lack of proper ventilation. Everybody with me? Yeah. Okay. The next group that we're targeting are um, law enforcement. Your police officers who shoot, uh, partial military personnel, and your aviation. Noise levels tend to be considerably, considerably loud. Now what makes us unique is that we're looking at custom options here for everyone. So none of those little, I went to CVS and I bought the little squeegees that go together. Anybody here go to the gym and listen to music on their iPod? Anybody? Okay. Anybody have a problem with their earbuds staying in their ears? Ready? Okay. So what we have the option of doing is creating custom portions for the earbuds that you already have. Pass those on. Those are my ears. So this is actually not an iPod because I'm not really eye friendly all the time. Um, but these are buds that I actually liked, and so what I did was was able to make um, impressions that actually match my specific ear, so that when I'm at the gym and I'm jumping up and down and I'm doing whatever I'm doing, I can keep whatever buds I bought, whether they're from the dollar store, whether they're from the Apple store, whether they're from Best Buy, um, attach those uh, pieces to the ends of them, and still be able to hear my music without them falling out. Short, sweet, talk to me. <laughs> I, I really like the last part, the, um, these custom bulb, bulbs. I, I like that. Um, that might have. I like the fact that you're, you, you have the professional experience tied behind the, the product that you're going to sell. Um, 300,000, uh, you, you may want, they may ask you to break that down a little bit more to, to really understand what the use of funds are. Um, in terms of, uh, sorry, if I miss it, but traction, in terms of uh, current traction use, testing it at some retailers, are you testing it online? Um, as far as, as far as the products are concerned? Yeah. Um, in the past, I did these for DJs. Um, another set that I have that I can actually show you are, um, custom noise plugs with filters. I actually use these when I go to clubs and parties. Um, I want to come out with my hearing and nothing else, okay? So these are actually um, a pair of filters. I actually started doing this because I have a cousin who DJs um, and is, ended up with a, an acoustic neuroma, which is actually a tumor on the auditory nerve which helps you to hear. Um, the tumor actually was pressing down on the nerve which was basically taking away his ability to hear. Um, so now he wears with that field because I was a DJ, I was a resident DJ at a, at a club called the Chase Lounge in Australia and, a, and a, I used to wear those Sennheiser uh, you know, headsets with one year off mm -hmm. to, to deal with the same issue. Um, now the the 300,000 what percentage of your company are you seeking? Um, 3%. Okay so, so the valuation is way off the charts and I think you've been told that yes. right before so. <laughs> <laughs> As he passes the mic. <laughs> So can you give us a sense of the market 
si size of this market? So what makes your, I mean, is the customization is what distinguishes or differentiates your product yeah, from what else is out there on the market? So how do you, so when you custom fit that, does that mean each wearer, you have to like fit it for each wearer and then um, the fact that it's custom fit is, I, I would assume it's probably more expensive than non-custom fit? Yeah, yeah, of course it can go by a completely store by fifty So what's gonna be the price differential between your product versus what's also, what's on the market currently? Um, it's What is it now, though, for the non-custom fit? Um, it's divided, so we do whatever they cost mm -hmm. in the store. So it's like, say, three, four dollars for one. Okay. You can use it once, maybe twice, and then you'll buy another set. These you use and put your ear shape place in. So most kids uh, would probably get a new set every summer, um, typically because if they're in the swimming season, that's when they will hurry up to try to get a new set. Adults will get them a little less. All right, so I got rapid fire questions. First one, did you get the speeding ticket or did you get out of it? <laughs> I have very unique ways of talking to DC cops to get out of speeding tickets. I did not get a speeding ticket. <laughs> okay. Um, so one of the things that, that I would suggest, and I don't, I, we didn't see the full presentation, but the numbers for what you're working on. So the problem, I think you did a great job of letting us know why we should be concerned about this issue. It resonates with a lot of people. Most people probably know a kid that had tubes. I was one of those kids that had those. So I think everyone can kind of relate to that. But the overall potential of the market would be really good to know. So beyond just DC, like literally how many people do you think you'll touch with the product, US based, how much money do you think is out there as well to be made? That type of thing would really knock it home. Um, and then the last question I have is, um, so of all the stuff that you're doing, is there something here that can be patented and protected? Yes. Which is? Um, actually, I have been, and it's not in process yet, but I've been toying with a couple different compounds. Currently, the compounds that are used right now to make the molds are implants. Um, they are typically hypoallergenic materials that are used. I'm looking into more biodegradable materials to be used. So I'm looking on that side as, 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 as far as going green and being more energy um, conservative, conservative when it comes to that. Monetarily, when it looks at money, you know, for, uh, globally or as far as the U.S. is concerned, mm -hmm. we're looking at every child in every school system with a set of at least one set of 20 gloves, um, especially in low-income areas because that's where the kids are really faltering. It's kind of a domino effect. If we fix this issue, we can have these issues. Okay. Um, so... Just 
So um, I, I would say whichever one's going to give you like a baseline of income right. if you can win a contract, then you can leverage that to actually get some of the other ideas that you have going, um, at least have some fun for that. Mm -hmm. Phil, one comment I have is um, um, it, it's always helpful. I always like to give entrepreneurs comps, you know, comparables of other companies that have a niche product targeting uh, a certain consumer base. And in your case, um, there's this, I know it sounds bizarre, but compression socks have been around for a long time, just like all kinds of hearing uh, ear based products, right? And this, um, uh, this entrepreneur uh, runs the site called vimvigor.com, V-I-M-V-I-G-R.com. Uh, and, and she sold, uh, you know, when she started out, it just, I, I, I didn't know anything about the business, just like I don't know anything about yours. So I, I just did, it sounded really wacky to me. But um, she ended up selling like 17,000 socks at like a $33 price point or something ridiculous out of a house in Montana. Um, and, and I was just, you know, shocked, right? So, so I think you really should maybe take some chances and, and sort of explore the internet, potentially use her as a comp, see how she's marketing her business, because she's doing it completely organically via social media. And, uh, v i m v i g r dot com, vimvigor dot com, and um, so so this is just a comp for you to look at. And might be interesting. That's it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Great job, and now we have. Coming to the stage, Lisa Williams.
Okay, while Lisa is getting ready to get set up, we have some technicalities that we're working through. And so at this point, we'll have, is it Arsha Jones? Arsha? A-R-S-H-A Jones? Going once, going twice? She's not here. Theodore Johnson, Brush With Life? You seem to also have a setup. Let's, let me ask this question. Who does not have a PowerPoint or any other technological setup? And you are? Orlean, you are the next lucky participant. Come on down, darling. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Sharks. My name is Orlean Grant. I'm president and founder of the Grant Group. We are a healthcare uh, management consulting firm. We believe in the systems approach to the individual. My background is community mental health nursing. Uh, I've been a psychotherapist, worked a lot in the compliance review industry for the healthcare organizations, both private, um, public sector, and also nonprofit. The reason I started my company in 2008 was to look at the total person and take all the skills I had developed and also a collection of colleagues that were really de dedicated to improving access of care to the minority populations. It was also the time that the housing bubble um, went and so it was either the best of times or the worst of times, the best decision or the worst decision that I made. It turned out to be the best decision. We have been active and received our first contract within 30 days of starting the company. We are diversified. We're on the federal level. Uh, we're on the county level. We also work with nonprofits. We work with the private sector. And we also do a lot of giving back to the community. So we do a lot of philanthropic work in working with um, community-based organizations, challenging other organizations, and providing um, free technical assistance and strategic planning. One of the things we do as far as core competency and business model, uh, we specialize in compliance reviews. We can look at any organization, healthcare, develop standards and do compliance as far as looking at federal, state, local, or contractual relationships. We also have been dedicating our branch uh, that we recently uh, added to the grant group in community outreach and collaboration, working with um, some foundations such as DC um, Cancer Consortium, Susan G. Coleman Foundation, and also uh, the Sea Change Foundation, in which we do outreach into the community on different standards, access to care issues, and bring the community in to develop community-based decisions. We recently have expanded into reviewing uh, healthcare management organizations. We're in the state of Massachusetts now for our third year. And we are looking at expanding also that on a national level. Excuse our, me. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Your two minutes is up. And now if we can hear from our sharks and keep okay. the microphone close. To Since you. you allowed the first one to go first um, and expand it, our ask is 250000 We are looking for that so I can uh, develop the infrastructure for the office, allow me to be out in the community, and also to have staff that can do the cycles for solicitations, proposal, and responses and that would help us grow and double. We are profitable and we have been solvent since 2008. How, so how big is the staff today? Um, I have staff that are 1099s. I have a virtual mm -hmm. office. I have a core group of nine consultants that work with me on most projects and then I can pull from the rest of my consultant base, which is 17. And then when it comes down to doing the proposals, are you the main person? Do you have other people that you would consider to be It depends upon the proposal. Okay. If it's a sources sought, it would be me and probably one other person. Uh, I do joint ventures. We have strategic partners in all parts of the country, including the Chickasaw Nation, uh, APS Healthcare, and we are building that strategic base so that we can um, build our response time. And the last question is, um, your pricing model, is it more 
do you, is it a flat fee type of project? How do you, how do you typically start? It depends. Um, if it's the federal government, it comes with fee base plus. Mm -hmm. um, most of the times, if it's nonprofit or if it's, if it's a, a foundation, it would be a flat fee. So we have to strategically project what the hours will be and then stay within that budget. About how many clients do you have on an annual basis? Um, we have projects that range from nine months to 12 months to 24 to 36 months. So it could be five to three and they're on a rotational basis. Our main stay is uh, repeat customers that expand our contracts. Okay. So um, can, you just, can you just tell me who, the, who your market is exactly? The market is to um, community health centers, foundations that primarily are in health care, um, and it could be in research policy analysis, policy development, uh, federal interaction. Uh, we've expanded to HBCUs, working with Howard University, doing strategic planning, the health care issues, the Affordable Care Act, and mega community concepts. Are you based in D.C.? We're headquarters are in um, Vienna, Virginia. We have a project office in Prince George's because we believe we need to have an impact there because of the health care issues, which are so persistent. But we're looking to be a national company. Thanks. Now, what is what is what is the total you know what does the competitive landscape look like when you're out there? Competitive landscape has opened up tremendously with the Affordable Care Act coming into vogue, even though it's been here for quite some time. So there's a huge opportunity for data gathering and analysis because we have to be able to understand the medical home patient-centered approach and all the different avenues that are open now for preventive health and doesn't really have an impact. So it's just blossomed in the last year or so after the sequestration. And then in terms of your proprietary advantage, what mm -hmm. would you say that's really hard to copy, really, you know, just only your firm can deliver on that? I would say it's our community-based approach and approach to working and joining with the organization. We are consultants, we're coaching, we help the organization come into its own versus just doing a review. We really give back as far as technical assistance, strategic planning, and coaching all along the way. So you, your return, your investment is a, probably 150%. Um, do, do you find that there's a shortage of psychotherapists for the projects that you have? Uh, having a master's in mental health, nursing, and former, former psychotherapist, Psychotherapy as my background, absolutely. There's also a shortage, especially for pediatric substance abuse, um, and there's going to be a groundswell for community health workers to kind of fill that gap, but there's also going to have to be a lot of training and integration of that in order to meet the mandates for the ACA. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful job, Arlene. Thank you so much. And now back to our podium, we'll have Lisa Williams with Cap 8 Doors and Hardware. Just pull it up for my own uh, reference point. Actually worked great, fantastic. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate you uh, allowing me to give you a quick overview of my company. I have a door distribution company called Cap Eight Doors and Hardware, and we supply doors, frames, and hardware for a lot of different clients, a lot of different um, uh, commercial uh, uses. Um, I'll give you a quick. Um, uh, this is actually not the right presentation. I'll give you a quick about the uh, the company, and as well as about where we're headed. So Cap 8 Doors and Hardware was started back in 2011. Really didn't get focused and figure out what I wanted to do until 2000, really 13. First year of business was really 2013 in essence when we started selling doors, frames, and hardware. We did a million dollars the first year uh, in, in business, which was pretty good. Our growth this year is, is pretty exponential. Uh, we project that we'll probably do close to anywhere from three to five million dollars this year in sales. 
Uh, we're the only minority uh, women-owned door company in the U.S. And the market for doors, frames, and hardware is pretty tremendous, especially in, in a district. What we really need to grow is we need probably about $300,000 in working capital and $800,000 line, uh, line of credit. The margins in this, in this business are fairly decent. The gross margins are around you know, 25%. Uh, once you factor in uh, GNA, general and administration, we tend to be right around uh, 10%, which is fairly high uh, for the construction industry. Again, we primarily do distribution, and our primary clients have been larger companies um, in the market space. So we've worked a lot with uh, companies like Turner Construction, uh, Donahoe, and uh, DPR. Um, but our main focus has also been school projects within the district. So again, being the only minority female-owned company, uh, we've pretty much gotten the vast majority of the projects that we've gone after. Our hit rate has been greater than 50%. Uh, we have a really great team, uh, spent a lot of time focused on hiring the best people that we possibly can get in the industry. Um, there's a lot of like points of failure potentially in the door industry, so we try to negate that by making sure that we have the best people possible. Um, so I'll, I'll stop right there. I only have two minutes, and I'll defer to you guys for questions. Thank you. What's your background? Um, actually, I was a management consultant for about six years, and I left management consultant. I started another company, which I still own, Senate Realty, which is a real estate brokerage company, and I've owned that for about eight years. I actually handed it over to my brother last year. He runs it day to day, and uh, I foc I've been focused on this 100% for the past year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think you were just going to, I see you listed on, on the New York Stock Exchange someday or something. <laughs> you're, you're, there's, you, you. you really, that. we're, we're going to be coming to you and asking you for money pretty soon. So, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. It's very high. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's incredible. Just a couple of things. I don't, I don't, um, uh, a minority uh, uh, female entrepreneur I'd invested in actually introduced me to Shark Tank. Yes. Um, and I started watching every episode uh, right. since, right? But, um, and, and recently, uh, there was one wh where there was a, all the sharks were fighting over uh, an authentication. Some guy had a door lock that had iPhone-based authentication. Some of you remember that, right? Mm -hmm. So I would actually urge you to, to look at someone, because you are, you, yeah. you, you're really savvy, creative, uh, and, and you've, you've kind of done a lot in very little period of time. I think you should now look for the proprietary advantage mm -hmm. and, and think of something, uh, that, that gives you a long haul uh, competitive advantage versus what you have today, right? Sure, Which is, so, yeah. So I think it, it's incredible uh, mm -hmm. what you do. I just don't know anything about construction. <laughs> so right, I, yeah, I, really I, I didn't either before I got into it. Yeah. You know, that's, that's really yeah. special, so right. you know, just congratulations. Thank you, appreciate that. Huh? So I if you were to get the, the $800,000, right. um, now ideally you would want that traditional debt line of credit or? Uh, actually, the uh, ideal scenario would be working capital with $300,000 of working capital, and I would allocate that towards primarily a couple more salaries. I need a couple more uh, full-time project managers to work with us, so uh, three new PMs mm -hmm. would be the working capital piece. Uh, we're pretty much squared away in terms of inventory and, and what we need in-house. Uh, um, I th and, and machinery, we're pretty good to go with machinery as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the line of credit would be to, to, to help us with the cost of goods sold. So mm -hmm. um, you know we have we have thirty a net thirty day terms for all of our manufacturers. Mm -hmm. So you know there's times when you have that lull, you know between when you build a client and when you receive payment. Sometimes there's that 15, 15 day lull where there's n no money, and so just being able to bridge the gap is what a line of credit would be. Okay. Uh huh. Why is why is there equity in this right in this Michael Lee spot? So sure. Oh, no, no, I'm not offering off equity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh -huh. It would be exciting if you were offering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Our next presenter, Arsha Jones. Let's give her a round of applause as she comes forward. My name 
is Arsha Jones, and I'm the CEO of Capital City, and we produce Capital City Bumbo Sauce. I'm not sure if any of you are from and born and raised in D.C. like I was, but Mumbo Sauce is a wing sauce, kind of like how Buffalo's wings are to New York and how New York cheesecake is to New York as well. And this is kind of our thing here. We have mumbo sauce, we have go-go music, and we have half smokes, right, people? <laughs> and so what we did was I moved outside of the area into Maryland, and it was a little harder to find. So I said, you know what? I'm going to take this sauce and bottle it and sell it on store shelves to other people like me who've moved away from the area and can no longer get access to this, um, this delicacy, really. Um, <laughs> so we've been, we've been in business for about uh, going on four, three, three or four years now. We're kind of crossing over the mark right now. And um, we've pretty much been um, going full steam ahead um, right off the bat. After two months of being in business, we were featured on the first front page of the Washington Post, as well as um, on Fox 5 and with that crew, with Tony Perkins and them, and um, various other media outlets. Right now, we're looking for funding of $100,000, and that will help us take our business um, from local to a national level. Right now, we've started off just selling online, but we're currently in 20 area locations, including uh, five restaurants, one of which is the world famous um, Ben's Chili Bowl. You guys know that? So when you, <laughs> so when you go there and eat chicken wings and mumbo sauce, that's ours. Um, they supply direct, they get it directly from us. And we're really um, looking to expand this and like I said, take our product to a national audience. Okay, so what were your what are your annual sales? Um, so last year our annual sales were about fifty five thousand, um, and this year we're looking at doing about eighty three. And um, just taking consideration, this was all done with zero advertising. Mumbo Sauce in this area is a brand without there being an actual brand behind the product. So virtually, you can go in any location in the area and find Mumbo Sauce in restaurant locations, but we're the first ones to actually bottle it. So we've had to do zero advertising. Okay. Yeah, it's great. Is there, uh, is there a proprietary competitive advantage? Why couldn't someone just like you go and do the same thing? Um, that's probably been an issue. There is, there is no proprietary advantage to doing this. We were just the first ones to do it. It's been a sauce that's been around in the D.C. area since my grandmother was little, and it's always been a kind of thing in the community, in the black community, that says, why doesn't someone <coughs> just bottle it? And until now, no one had. <laughs> so. no, that's great. Uh, t you t you f are you familiar with the Tabasco story? Um, yeah, kind of. It's, it's, yeah. it's actually very similar. Yeah, to it's that. It's a family-owned business. And yeah. You know, anybody can make Tabasco sauce. Right. You know, they've got a nice. Uh, it's a land grab. So I wouldn't. You know, I would actually sell your vision uh, as a much larger vision. Mm -hmm. um, you know, asking for millions. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but yeah, but right. but basically, you're looking for a land grab opportunity. Yeah. Because, yeah. Um, and, and I wouldn't be shy about you know. Getting $100,000 is as hard as getting a million dollars. So, right, so you yeah. Know, just going, going for it is probably a good thing. Right? Okay. And to someone who knows the food business well, mm -hmm. right? So. Right. I've actually invested um, in, a, in a food company. Okay. Um, so I know a little bit about okay. like, food companies. Not a ton. I've, I've learned a little bit. But, um, I mean, where do you see yourself long term? Do you have an exit strategy for this? Do you want to you know, build this brand and then eventually, you know, sell it to, <laughs> you know, a Heinz or yeah. one of those kind of companies? Sure, I'm, I'm actually open to the, um, initially we started as a family business. It was run by me. I'm the majority owner, then my husband and other family members, they work and do sales and things like that, administrative duties. Um, but we're always open to that opportunity um, because there's such a huge marketplace for this product. Um, and that is, um, you know, that's reflected by our sales. Um, so I, we're open to the opportunity, yes. Okay. Yep. We're actually out of time. So okay, thank all right then. Thank you very then. much. <laughs> Arsh, the only thing I saw wrong with your presentation is that you didn't bring us any. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's minor. We can work on that. I don't know if they're really that hungry. But thank you very much, and very good luck to you.
I believe that we are ready for our next presenter, who is setting up right now, Theodore Johnson, Brush With Life. Hello, my name is Theodore Johnson. I'm the founder. I am uh, the CEO. I'm the uh, executive producer of a company called Brush With Life. Brush With Life started out about six years ago with a partner of mine named Kevin McPherson. We're artists and we travel the world extensively for our craft. I've designed TV commercials, um, a lot of campaigns. I've worked with some very high net worth people painting their families. But one thing I realized when I travel the world is artists are received well everywhere they go. Uh, unlike photographers, unlike tourists, if they recognize you as an artist, you're welcome into their homes. But as a visual person, I never saw anything that captivated me on TV. And if I did, it was segmented programming. So I went forth and talked to a lot of TV companies and uh, PBS and said, I want to produce programming for the visual arts, content that could be understood around the world, regardless of where you came from. Some of the best creative minds are artists, from designers of cars, clothes, furniture, painting, etc. So I did this, and I put my show on PBS and received rave reviews, but no one can find my content. So with Netflix coming on board and the ability to launch your own network, I did this for a year. I reached 22 countries without any advertising, got over 5,000 subscribers paying $1.99. I then got 25 investors and raised over half a million dollars. I reached out to celebrities like uh, Tim and Daphne Reed. I have the founder who put the Sears radio in Ford cars. I have uh, magazine publishers all working for me. The main thing we want to do is launch this network on our own. And if we have the funding, we've been promised access to 4.5 million artists in the United States. We were partnering with the number one TV manufacturer in China. And our model that we're following is the Food Network. It's very, there's only a few topics in the world that everyone understands without translation. There's food, there's travel, there's art, and music. A lot of these have already been exploited. And for the longest of time, I couldn't understand why no one had brought art to the masses. Theodore, when, I apologize, sure. but your two minutes is up. Great. Would you please give your ask? What I'm going to do is show the sharks what my TV network will look like. And I'm asking for $5 million to do 250 hours of content. I've already been offered a million dollars for my first series. I have over 36 hours of original content, and I have a production studio in New York and in Virginia. So I will show you the, what the network will look like for your understanding why it's so different. devoted to the 
visual arts on television. Brush with life, not just a channel, an experience. Share the unique shows with your kids. Designed to teach the fundamentals of art. Featuring the cutting edge technologies being used by artists today. So now that our Sharks have had an opportunity to see a little portion of what the network will have to offer, if you would, let us hear, we know your ask, and now we'll hear from our Sharks. Okay. Um, so there, the, the, the few ways I want to, I'm just thinking aloud here, right? Because I'm always thinking about how I can help if there's something meaningful, and you would definitely have something meaningful. And the reason I know you have something meaningful is because years ago, uh, I used to have a customer called Poor Kids um, for a company that we built and sold to Yahoo, um, and Poor Kids TV, and they were just printing money, right? And, and it just the ad load on it, and just it, it, so I know that that kids video content or video content targeting kids, especially for educational, is a, is perhaps the highest one of the, among the highest value content out there, right? So so that's a great start. The second thing is, um, if you're in New York, I have excellent relationships with the folks at Tribune Networks. So th they have, they own about 20 odd channels in different markets. Um, I can get you in front of um, the right people to have a conversation. Now the really good news is, um, the, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'd be surprised if you get your own network right off the bat, though I wish you would, right? But I just know a lot about that business and um, it's, it's extremely competitive, cutthroat, and it's all about sponsors, right? I mean, how, how many sponsors you can get on the show? Uh, you know, it's about the ad sales people that actually drive the programming on the network. Okay. So what I would do is, you know, you can actually get with about for two to two to two to three thousand dollars, you can get your segment up on a non-prime time segment, right? And there are ways where you can do deals with the networks to get your airtime. Um, so when you do, if we, when you're in New York next, because you have a studio okay. there, I'll take you to the right people to have a short conversation. Um, we'll send them the material beforehand, and it might turn out to be a long conversation. So um, I think there is there's some way I can add value, but you know, five million dollars is w way too risky for for you know for seeding a network, you know, for just knowing what I know about the business, you know. No, I mean, I think you have a, a really great idea. No one else is doing this. Um, I do agree with you. I think $5 million is a is a big ask. Um, have you thought about, you know, Google now has all of these channels. And actually, I know someone who, um, he's a music video director in the Latino market and the Latin market. And he, you know, got several million to launch a channel on Google. Um, I know for a fact that they're looking at channels and, and all that other stuff. That could be also a vehicle with YouTube, on, you know, YouTube property. Um, I, I would think about how you can kind of bootstrap this, you know, now that we have the internet, you know, you can do this pretty easily and build up a buzz that way. And then, you know, um, but it sounds like you're already doing that. You said you have 5,000. What, what's, the, what's the platform for the 5,000 subscribers? Currently, we have 15,000 people waiting with access to 4.5 million names. If and this is a gentleman who has access to every college in the United States. He's been in business for 100 years. He's out of Chicago. He's promised me access to these names if I will produce all the content that I've already protected. I have two United States patents. I have several trademarks. I have over produced 25 pilots. And I have had offers for my shows that I've produced for a million dollars. The key is, is that I wanted to be able to broadcast globally and own the content rights to a global audience. I also can broadcast my content on airlines and ships. And the number one TV manufacturer in China has offered to put my app on their TVs. And they um, want my content in China, but they want to partner with me and pay 50% of the money if I have a US lead. 
I mean, creating content is really expensive. Correct. I mean, have you thought about, you know, kind of having a couple of con pro properties that you create and then licensing at some of this other content? I'm trying to think of just right. a way, you know, how a workaround, because content creation is, is highly expensive. Correct. And that was the barrier to entry, um, and that's why I feel as if uh, making the content our own, which is universal and timeless, I was invited to Discovery Channel to show my ideas. The main thing is that right now, I think it's the time to move with everyone doing their own content. And I talked to a Sony executive who said, if I do my own content, I can actually repurpose uh, dying channels on Comcast and literally give them my 250 hours and tell them you can have it for your traditional broadcast and give me pennies on each subscriber and I will keep broadcasting exclusively through the internet. So two, two other relationships that might help. Have you traveled overseas much? Yes, I came happened? back from China and Bahrain. My partner's in China now. The government has brought him over there a few times. He's working with the Chinese government and he is an artist ambassador. And I went to the Middle East, to Bahrain, and speaking to the, trying to get invitation to Saudi Arabia with the art interest that has been shown there. Yeah, because, um, you know, they played fashion TV a lot. Correct. And that's, right, if you, if you, if you go to it's a model that right. works. It's a model that works, and it's syndicated content. So I'll get you in front of the attorney. It used to actually be my roommate years ago, and, and, and he knows a lot about that business, how that business grew, so that might be some good insight. The Google um, option is actually a very real option. Uh, I was introduced to it as someone who actually got funded by Google for a sports channel, and okay. they sit around drinking beer and talking about sports. Not nearly as exciting as your stuff, right? So, um, you know, I, I think there's some productive ways to have an ad value. Thank you. I don't think you can get much better than somebody's roommate from college. You have a lot of dirt that you would have on that person. I know my roommate does about me. And we're ready now for our next presenter with BB and Brown. Let's give her a round of applause. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Julie Pittman, and I am uh, the founder of something very new that I'm extremely excited about. And, um, and Sharks, uh, thank you so much. I, I, I want you to know how fortunate you are to be sitting this many feet from gold. <laughs> I just want you to know you have tapped into something, a vein of gold that, that spans and, and runs over 75% of the planet. Okay, and I'll show you why in just a second. Um, I am a, uh, a licensed skin specialist. Uh, I have a 30 year, 33 year career in the beauty industry as a licensed esthetician, professional makeup artist, as well as uh, I'm a holistic es esthetician. And so um, uh, green ingredients and, and healthy things that are healthy for the skin are very important to me. Um, I have been exclusively custom blending makeup for the last 27 years and have the very unique experience as a holistic skin specialist that 95% of my clientele over the last 30 years have been women of color. And so I um, have seen and solved so many different kinds of problems and skin concerns, including acne and rosacea, as well as the, the, the ever-present dark circles under the eyes, um, and the issues of anti-aging for women of color. Now, the other thing that is very particular to uh, my work in the cosmetic industry is the level of expertise that I have achieved in creating the deepest reach into the skin tone um, uh, spectrum. Because we know how many of us in here have had the worst time finding the right color for your skin. Show of hands, please. Look at my market. Almost everybody in the room. <laughs> and there is a reason why. In skin tone variations, Caucasians have eight variations of skin tone versus people of color who have 38. And yet, in most cosmetic lines, which average about 12 colors in presentation, you will see eight shades for light skin and four on the end for darker complexions. Tan, deep, dark, and maybe some mahogany. 
and yet you have this whole entire market of people, three quarters of this room raise their hands saying, I need something more, I need something better. And I'm here to say the world is saying the same thing because 75% of the planet is people of color. So we so need something better from you. You need and something And you better. need something better from them. Yes. Let's get with the ass, girlfriend. All right, here we go. <laughs> So we will get right to it, because when it comes to anti-aging, it means something different to ethnic skin. We are not worried about wrinkles, because as we know, good black don't crack, but it does sag, discolor, and get acne <laughs> after 35, <laughs> as we see here. The solution is BBs in brown, BB creams that do all of these great benefits that you see here on the screen, tightening, toning, healing. We have wonderful um, 12 colors that actually work on 48 different skin tones. So everyone in this room is touched by everything on this table right now. I know we who are your asking, next first skin can be. Yes. <laughs> Let's get to the ask. We are asking for, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, we're asking for $500,000 so that we can take advantage of some current opportunities that we have right now. One is to um, make an appearance on the Home Shopping Network, um, as well as expanding our reach to salons and boutiques that are looking to expand their client base because they're now able to offer a product that will reach a market segment that they have not been able to reach before. The BB cream industry is huge now and fast growing in the market, nine million in sales just in the first year. Um, the market reach that uh, we're looking to um, capture um, with the green conscious woman of color, along with professional women of color, their, their daughters, the millennial women of, of color, as well as people into holistic health and folks who are very dedicated to the Buy Black movement represents um, some $39 billion that is available to us Right now, we are first to market because no one, I promise you, no one has as many colors to offer this market as we do right now. We can serve every woman in this room right now, and that's what we can do over 75% of the planet. So how, how do you distribute your product right now? What's I'm your, sorry? How do you distribute your, how are you distributing your product right now? Right now, we have begun um, with um, salons and boutiques. Uh, who are carrying for many, many years. I've been custom blending, so very intimate relationships with the customer moves the products very well. Um, so we have um, some reach in St. Louis as well as Philadelphia. Um, I've been a, a one-man show for a very long time, traveling up and down the eastern seaboard, but what has been common all along here and all the way to the Bahamas and back is that the, this new BB cream is the most exciting thing I've ever done in my 30-year career, 100% sales. Every single person who tries this product buys this product, and the only ones who don't, don't have their wallets at the time. So they come back. Wow. This is, this is, this is uh, very interesting. Now, your, and the 500,000, how much equity are you offering? 20%. And um, how, how does your website perform? Um, well, the, uh, the website has been doing very well. Um, I, I don't have an account in, in my head at this very second, but what has happened, we, um, it, back in July of last year, we made our first appearance, the BB made its first appearance in um, Essence Magazine, and um, the uh, hits to the account um, jumped five times the norm. So um, everywhere we go, we've had the experience of women putting this on their face. The pictures that you saw are all clients. And, and many of them, when the product was used on the skin and they finally found the right color, I know this sounds really ridiculous, like I'm really trying to sell something, but it's the truth. Right. They burst into tears. Yeah, no, I know. Women it's, it's cry. We, this market is so desperate for something that speaks to us mm -hmm. that they have traveled distances. I have people who fly in from other states just to come to get my products, as well as me shipping out to them, but they make, they make us a stop on their way through DC. And um, so one of the things about women of color, particularly the African-American woman who represents 20% of the beauty industry, one in every five beauty products purchased in this country today is purchased specifically by an African-American woman, and yet in a market so huge, nobody is talking to us until today. And so <laughs> what I'm asking, 
is for your help for me to say to this body, we hear you, we see you, and we have what you need. Now, it's, it's a very exciting product, and you're going to make a ton of money with or without anyone's help, okay? So, so that's clear. But um, what's, the, what's the subscription, um, uh, sorry, what's the usage rate of each of these tubes? So how frequently can someone buy it? This particular, what you see on the table here um, is a trial size. Uh, we have two sizes that we offer. This is a trial size. It retails for $25. Um, the, the full size uh, retails for $60. Uh, very easy price point. It is enough of a supply to last anywhere from um, one to two months at a time as an entire face is covered with literally one drop of product. So you get the, you get the coverage. Um, secondarily, what we are, um, our brand new offering for our clients is BB to go. This is a kit. When um, every lady in this room knows when we arrive anywhere in our car, the first thing we do is what? flip the visor, right? And you see all the heads nodding because we all do this. This attaches to your house keys. So instead of digging in the purse to find the, the touch-up, your touch-up is right here. You have your BB cream, your BB stick, which covers any um, blemishes or marks and heals at the same time because it's rich in healing um, elements. And then you have your, uh, our silk, which is a talc-free oil control powder and a little brush, and it attaches to the key ring, and we've been getting $60 for, for this per unit. Really amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, l let's definitely talk after this, uh, because, um, you know, just, just given your sale, you know, even though I think you'll catch your valuation at some point, I think it's a bit rich, obviously, but um, um, the, the, there are things that can be done to give you traction, significantly greater traction, I think, also, uh, there are methods in which the community can fund your product uh, because you it sounds like you have a very committed buyer base. Yes. Uh, and for those types of products, you can often get what's called custom fi customer uh, based financing, which is the best kind of financing, right? Where a customer is prepaying for a set of products and yes. you're delivering over a period of time. So we'll talk about multiple different strategies. And, um, you know, I think there's something here. You know, there's, there's enough room for a conversation here. So. Great. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. And now for our final presentation. We have Shante Gray with the Kanga Corporation. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to uh, present my company. Uh, my name is Shante Gray. My company's name is Kanga Corporation. Uh, we are a sort of startup company, pre-launch and pre-sales of our very own trash can line, of which I would like to pass those down so that you can take a look. Um, I know most of the We've got a lot of women in the house, but uh, the men may be able to resonate with this and probably some of the women. But uh, if you are one that take the trash out at your home and you, uh oh, you didn't break anything. <laughs> if you're one that take the trash out at your home, you typically, well, some of us do, we throw unused trash bags at the bottom of the can to save time and make it a lot more convenient. Well, we, we sought out to solve a problem in our own house because my husband and my son, they're the ones that take out the trash, but we throw these bags at the bottom of the can, and unfortunately, they got soiled. So um, that idea was birthed out of trying to solve that actual problem. So our trash line actually has an adjustable compartment for the primary purposes of storing unused trash bags. Um, the market that we're actually trying to uh, cover is the retail consumer market, women and, and men ages 25 to 75 years old, lower to upper class, educated and uneducated in sustainability. What's unique about our product is that we do have a patent pending on the compartment, but as well it's made of an eco-friendly proprietary uh, resin blend. Um, 
Part of our market segment that we'll begin to focus on is waste management facilities, facility owners and operators, those facilities that um, are amusement parks and um, sports complexes, hotels, um, museums and the like, uh, as well as government and corporate entities. You can What's, have your ask now. Okay, okay. Thank you. <laughs> we're asking for, we're seeking 500000 in exchange for 25% equity in our company, and that's to produce our trash cans. Obviously, uh, tooling, we're going to manufacture them here in the States. Tooling is pretty expensive. We're, uh, it costs us about sixty five to 75000 just to produce the tooling for each line, uh, as well as we're looking to add more staff and uh, marketing dollars. So you said you have a patent pending, so you filed a provisional patent? Uh, yes, okay. we, we filed a provisional patent about two years ago, and uh, it's being prosecuted right now. Um, so we have to do certain things for the patent office to get it approved, obviously, and our patent attorneys are going through that process. Okay, good. So you, you are using an, uh, an attorney, because a lot yes. of entrepreneurs just do it themselves, and that's cool too, but so you're using a law firm. And, and so the patent office has written back, and now you're yes. going back and forth. Okay. Um, the, uh, you know, I would urge some, you know, so there is a large addressable market. Have you had preliminary conversations with any particular sort of market segment and are you getting uh, traction, at least in conversation? Lots of um, consumer traction. Lots of consumers are looking for the product. They want to save time. They like the fact that they can store their trash bags in the can. Uh, we have had conversation with some government entities. We're in the process of right now negotiating a contract where we're actually being awarded a contract with the state of Illinois, um, not just for our trash cans, but also for janitorial supplies as well. So that, that's exactly where I was going next, right? Like it's because the government's got a huge going green initiative, and if you look at you know FBO.gov and some of these other sites, uh, there's a lot of uh, you know they, they, they explicitly mention the green requirement. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's that's fantastic. The one other thing. You know, I will tell you is you really should, uh, you know, I advise you to, to, to look carefully at, at the licensing model because I think um, that'll help you. Yeah, it may sound like you're only going to get a small royalty, but I think some of these distribution of a product, even as innovative as this, is incredibly difficult and challenging. It and, is. And so, so if you can get a partner who already is plugged into all of these, you know, channels that you want to go, and, and they license the product from you, I think that's, that's a fantastic way to look at it. Sure. I think this is a great idea. Have you thought about, um, in addition to uh, storing trash bags, I mean, I see this also putting recyclables in that little compartment um, as well. So that compartment is so small that it can only actually hold. It looks a little bigger there mm -hmm. because of the model but it can actually only hold trash bags and possibly cleaning products. Okay, but I'm, yeah, I mean, it, but I'm saying, yeah, maybe for this particular prototype you have, but have you thought about, you know, maybe scaling it differently? Because I actually, I see, I mean, that the trash bag thing, I have that issue as well, and I bought a little compartment where I just put the plastic bags, but I know that recyclables, green and all that, if like, if you have that in a one container, I mean, I think that's also like a really great idea. I don't know if you thought about that, but. There's actually a product on the market like that that uh, I believe it's hefty. I believe they have that product. So unfortunately, we couldn't tie into that unless it, we did a design pen. Is, is, there, is there a cheaper way to do it where if you, um, as opposed to having it built on there, actually had it external so you could actually hook through like an apron or something? Because you're really just add, adding in space for the, the newspaper or, or for the plastic bags, right? Yes, so, we so have if, some other models. Yeah, because if you did that, it seems like you can get it in the house, more people's houses um, versus a person um, replacing their trash can. We have, well, that's part of the purpose of is actually to replace the trash can, okay. but we do have some models that have it built on the outside, okay. um, not a um, um, like a um, another part of it that can actually just attach to it. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have seen some phenomenal minds in front of us for the past hour or so. And at this time, we will bring all of our participants back out in front. And so we want to recap each company. And very quickly, of course, we want to commend them for their expertise. We commend you for your fortitude in continuing through with your business models. And we thank you again for making the presentation. Thank you all for your patience in the process. And the best part about this, of course, is that every time you practice, it makes perfect. So congratulations on yet another opportunity to present your amazing minds. So of course, we have Julia Wilson with Wilson Global, Latrice Herndon with Eargasmic Ears, <laughs> Cap H Doors and Hardware, uh, Capital City Mumbo Sauce, Brush with Life, BB and Brown, Kanga Corporation, and the Grant Group. That's how I have it listed on my page, but that's not exactly how they were uh, presented. Let's give them all a great big round of applause. Excellent. Quickly, Sharks and Coach, are there any final words? Are there any people that you would like to see after the fact? Are there any